Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. For today, our topic will be confined space entry. Specifically, we'll be discussing implementing the new standard for construction. As we begin today's webinar, I want to call your attention to a box towards the bottom of your controls. It's for submitting questions. We will be completing today's content at approximately 1.45, allowing about 15 minutes for question and answer. You can submit these questions at any time throughout the webinar by typing your questions into that question box there and sending. And that will submit your question for us to review. The first thing we'd like to do is to talk first about the purpose of the webinar. It's our intent to help construction companies understand and then pave way to compliance with the new OSHA standard. We're going to be making sure that we improve the understanding of the new confined space standard. We're going to talk about some requirements, definitions, training, and duties. We're also going to provide some tools for you in the, in the form of a checklist for implementing the standard. And then we're also, as I mentioned, going to attempt to answer some frequently asked questions regarding the new confined space rule. Please know that uh, our office has been in uh, constant contact with the OSHA area offices trying to get answers to some of our frequently asked questions here amongst our staff as we've been looking at compliance. This rule is brand new and there are no letters of interpretation currently written on the standard. So we are having some difficulty getting OSHA even to answer detailed questions. So we'll do the best we can. And we may have uh, questions that will have to uh, come up on our website. We'll ask you to look back there in the coming weeks for continued answer. We do want to make note, though, that this is not confined space entry training for entrants, attendees, supervisors, or rescue personnel. Each of those personnel will require additional training. This is simply an overview for management to gain an understanding of the compliance requirements of the new standard. That being said, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for today. Terry Prindeville is a construction health and safety technologist. He's also the director of operations here at Optimum Safety Management. It's been my pleasure to work with Jerry over the last great number of years of watching him implement and develop effective safety management systems within many of the area's construction and industrial firms. Jerry is our resident confined space expert, and it's my pleasure to introduce him at this point. Jerry, would you go ahead and take us through your outline and move us through the rest of your material today? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. As Steve alluded to, we're going to be uh, going through the outline for construction uh, in confined spaces. So here's what we've got coming for you this afternoon. So first, we're going to look at some background information. Then we'll take a look at uh, definitions, talk about responsibilities for each entity involved on a site where there are confined spaces. We'll look at classifying a confined space. Uh, we're going to talk about the training that's required for all facets of uh, work around confined spaces. We'll look at rescue and, again, what's required with that. And then we're going to talk, uh, lastly, about the implementation timeline. So when is all this due? And, you know, when do we actually have to be uh, going through all of the new parts of the brand new standard, as Steve said? So let's look a little bit at the background first. So you may be asking yourself, why did we have to have this new construction standard for, uh, or excuse me, confined space, space standard for construction? Well, if I ask the question to many of you out there, you know, how many of you have ever worked in or maybe even around a confined space? And I'm guessing the answer to that would vary anywhere from I've been involved in confined space entry on uh, numerous occasions to, you know, I'm really not even sure what a confined space is. So we want to look at uh, how that compares to the general industry standard because that, in fact, has been in play for years and years. And so finally, the construction arena is catching up with the general industry standard. Uh, the problem with construction is there's, there's so many unique characteristics in construction as opposed to the general industry uh, arena. So they couldn't just say, well, let's just follow all the same rules that we have in general industry 
in the construction arena because they just don't work. There's a lot of rules uh, in general industry that don't cover specific things that happen in construction. So that's why we had to have a, a new standard. Um, work began on this construction standard uh, back in 1993. So it's taken a while to get this ready for implementation, but it's here and it's time to make sure that everybody's on board and they know what it is that they need to do to be, in, number one, keep your employees safe, and number two, be in compliance with the new OSHA standard. So a little bit more on the background. So how did we base this need that we have to have this new standard? Well, one of the ways it was uh, taken on was they were looking at different fatalities and accident data that was occurring on construction sites when employees were working on or around confined spaces. And then also looking at OSHA's enforcement experience. So when OSHA was on a job site, you know, what were they seeing? What were the hazards that were out there? What were you know, not properly being addressed? And then they were also taking advice from different committees um, for you know, construction safety and health. So they're getting advice from those uh, groups as well to determine hey, just what do we need to have in play to make this new standard what it needs to be. The so current construction standard, uh, the thinking is that it really doesn't adequately protect the employees in the construction arena from things like atmospheric hazards, so bad air is basically what we're looking at there. You know, it doesn't protect against mechanical issues, uh, things that maybe aren't being locked out. It should be to keep you know, the release of stored or hazardous energy uh, when an employee is in a confined space and all of a sudden something starts and you know, because it wasn't properly locked out and now that employee is being struck by moving equipment. And, you know, there's all kinds of other hazards as well. If things, something as simple as heat. You know, if you've got guys working in tunnels, are we doing something about how hot it gets down there? Or if we've got people working, if you're looking at the picture, uh, if we've got people working in storm sewers, what are we doing to address the possibility of water suddenly coming into that space that wasn't there initially? How are we protecting against that? So we're, again, we're looking at some statistics. There's about six deaths and 967 injuries annually uh, just in confined spaces on construction sites. So the thinking is, is that if this new standard is implemented and implemented properly, that this is going to reduce these numbers by about 90%. So that's very substantial. So we certainly want to make sure that we get this done properly and, and stop with these deaths and, and you know, 967 injuries. Um, and that's the ones that are reported. So you know, we don't even know how many more could be out there that we're not even sure about as far as injuries go. So when we look at construction, you know, what are some of the concerns that we have with uh, implementing, you know, why do we have to have a new standard for confined spaces? Well, one of the problems is you know, high employee turnover. So there's a lot of employees coming and going in different companies. They may be working today, maybe for the month, maybe for six months and then they go someplace else and go on to another site, uh, go work for another company. So a lot of turnover. Same employee working at multiple sites. Today he's on this job site, tomorrow he's working at another one, so on and so forth. And I want to make sure that that per person is protected not just at one site, but at any site that they go to so that everybody is on the same page. You should be able to go to any construction site if there's a confined space. It should all be handled the same way. Short-term tasks. Guy's only going to be on site for a couple hours, and that's all he's going to be there for. He needs to go into a some kind of a storm sewer for he's going to do some some patching. He's only going to be in there for a little little while. Well, how long does it take for somebody to get hurt or worse, you know, even get killed? So we want to make sure that it doesn't make any difference how much time it takes. Everybody still needs to be trained and protected against hazards in confined spaces. And these spaces are constantly evolving. So work is being done. Is there being constructed? Are there different trades involved? You know, there's always something changing in these spaces, much like a construction site in itself. Very fluid location. Things are constantly changing and evolving. We really want good communication for everybody that's working there. There's multiple contractors and multiple controlling contractors, possibly. Again, we need to have communication so that everybody knows what everybody's doing. And somebody's not introducing a hazard to a confined space because nobody told them there were guys working in there. You've got to have good communication. And then workers are just plain unfamiliar with the hazards associated with confined spaces. They may not understand how gases can build up or how working in a space with a cutting torch can 
contribute to a bad atmosphere, possibly make it explosive. So we need to make sure that employees are aware of what's going on in these spaces. So let's look at some definitions. So by now you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not really even sure what a confined space is. So let's find out, okay? So first of all, what is a confined space? Well, it has to meet three specific criteria. It has to be large enough to enter, so you need to be able to get your body in there to do some kind of work. It has to have limited access. Uh, there is some confusion I've heard on numerous occasions where someone will say, one way in, one way out. And I even had at one location a, a guy tell me, well, if I put two ladders in here, it's no longer a confined space because I've got two ways of getting in and out. No, that's not correct. It's limited access. So simply installing another ladder doesn't change that. It's still limited. And then the third criteria is it's not designed for continuous occupancy. So if you look at the picture on your screen, we've got a couple guys, looks like you know, they're in some kind of a manhole. Uh, obviously, that's not set up for someone to go to work there every day. It's, you know, these guys are when they're doing some kind of work, whether it's construction, repair, um, you know, demolition is, is uh, a harsh portion that's going to be, you know, concerned with confined spaces as well. So if you look at those three criteria, it meets all three of those, you've got yourself a confined space. Now from there, we need to determine what kind of a confined space is it. So if we're looking at a permit required confined space, all right, it has to meet all the first three criteria. And then it only needs to meet one of the following. So a hazardous atmosphere that ventilation will not reduce to a safe level, or it has inwardly converging, sloping, or maybe tapering surfaces. So think about a hopper bottom where people could get in there and slide down and then you know, not be able to get out, or an engulfment or any other physical hazard. So if we're looking at engulfment, I think most people think that engulfment is water. And that's true. That is an engulfment hazard. But there's other engulfment hazards out there as well, things such as sand, um, even grain. Uh, I personally know of a gentleman who ended up suffocating in a grain bed because they did not control the site. He got into the middle of it. The grain basically had covered over with mold. He went down into the grain, and it covered him up, and he ended up suffocating in grain. So that's, again, doesn't have to be water. It's something that can engulf you. So you need to be looking at that. What are the hazards? And then any existing hazard that could cause serious uh, uh, injury or death. So things can include things like explosives, um, mechanical devices. We're looking at electrical, hydraulic, pneumatic energy. What are we doing to make sure that those things are properly isolated so that they don't uh, release that hazardous energy? We can be looking at falls, radiation, temperature extremes, especially this time of year. You know, is it so hot that the guys are going to collapse while they're working in the space? So we're looking at temperature extremes. And even noise. If it's so noisy that employees in there can't hear if there's a problem, and they couldn't, you know, somebody was telling them to get out and they couldn't hear it, it's certainly a very much a hazard, and that would all be part of a permit-required space. If we have a permit space, we may be able to uh, reclassify that to what we call an alternate space. So an alternate space is one that initially starts out as a permit required uh, confined space, but the only hazard is air quality or potential air quality. And if we can control that through ventilation, so we can set up fans and blowers, and we have uh, been able to control that and get it down to a level where workers can safely be in that space, then we can reclassify this to an alternate space. But it, again, the only hazard can be atmospheric or even potential atmospheric hazard is the only way that we can control that and then we can make that into an alternate space. All right, so if we're looking at the different entities for confined space work, uh, first we have our host employer. And the host employer is the one that owns them or manages the property where the construction work is actually taking place. Right, so could be the owner of a, a building, could be the owner of a uh, any type of work that's being done at a, you know, a mall, for instance, something like that. You know, there's, there's confined spaces every portion of construction work. There's a lot of them out there, and I think we, we really need to begin thinking about that. So the host employer owns the property. The controlling contractor, on the other hand, is the employer that has the overall responsibility for the construction at that particular work site. General contractors is basically what we're looking at here. And then the entry employer is any employer who decides 
or directs employees to enter a confined space. All right. So how does this concern you? Well, let's take a look. Who's covered by the standard? Well, who's covered is any employer who's engaged in construction work where there's confined space at that site. Now, notice I didn't say someone who's putting guys into a confined space. It's even if there's one on a site where you're working, you're covered by the standard. So you need to make sure that your employees are aware of that. Um, employers who hire subcontractors to operate within the confined spaces. So you're actually, again, here we go. You're maybe not doing the work, but you've hired somebody to do it. You're covered by the standard. And different things that we're looking at that would be considered a confined space include things like bins, manholes, tanks, sewer systems, transformer vaults, storm drains, manholes, et cetera. Again, there's a lot of different things out there that we need to be looking at and saying, does this meet the criteria to be a confined space? Now, there are a couple of exclusions that are out there. So one of them being diving, covered by subpart Y, um, non-sewer activity in uh, excavations. So the way it's that being subpart P, and the way this is really set up is that if the, the current um, subpart covers the hazards, then they're not going to be looking at that with a confined space. Now, we're looking at excavations, though. If we you know, tap into a live sewer, now we've just taken an excavation and turned it into something that's going to be covered by the confined space standard. So we have to be careful about where we're working, whether we're covered or not. So once we determine that, yes, we've got confined spaces and we're going to be either be working around them, in them, or telling someone to go work in them, you know, we need to look at who has responsibilities for what. So as the host employer, you know, again, as I talked, to, I talked about a little bit earlier, a big portion of this new standard deals with communication. So we need everybody on site to know what everybody else is doing and where these confined spaces are located. So the host employer needs to provide information to the controlling contractor. So they need to tell them, you know, hey, I know there's a confined space over in this part of the site. Got to let you know where that's at. I know these are the hazards or even the potential hazards in each one of these spaces. And, you know, here's some precautions that have already been taken. So the host employer has to provide that information to the controlling contractor. Well, then the, control, the controlling contractor, I mean, what he or she needs to do is, number one, review what the host employer has given them, so any information that they have, review it, understand it, you know, ask questions if they need to, but they need to know what's going on with that information they've been provided. And then once they have that information, they need to provide it to each uh, employee who's entering the confined space or even whose activities could create a hazard within the permit space. So you may not have employees working in a confined space, but if you're going to be, be performing any kind of work outside of the space, um, if you're going to be doing cutting, grinding, um, you know, you're going to be driving fork trucks or lulls or that type of thing around the space, you know, those could create outside hazards that would need to be taken care of as well. Again, communication is key. And then we get to the entry employer. So this is the employer who's actually going to have employees go into that space to perform some work. And as you can imagine, there's a lot more responsibilities if you actually have the employees going into that space. So they need to be aware of all the controlling contractors' information. So again, communication between not only the host and you know controlling contractor, but the entry employer, those all have to be taken care of before the job starts. All right? And then once the job does start, there's something else that comes up. Maybe the entry employer now has discovered another confined space. So they have to provide that information as well. Uh, the entry employer also has to provide the controlling contractor with a program that shows how he or she is going to work within these spaces and keep their employees safe. The entry employer also has to prevent unauthorized entry. So to do any work in a confined space, you have to be authorized. Uh, so we need to make sure that only those people are are working around that space, especially in that space. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. I want to be able to identify what are the acceptable conditions. So what do we need to do beforehand to make sure that that space is safe for our employees to go work in? 
We need to identify and evaluate the permit space hazards prior to entry. So we're going to talk here in just a few minutes about a uh, form that needs to be filled out, the permit itself. You know, that permit needs to address several issues and why we're filling that permit out is, is that basically it's a checklist to make sure that we have controlled the hazards in the area to keep our employees safe. The uh, employer needs to provide entrance with the opportunity to observe uh, any monitoring or testing of permit spaces. So if we're doing air monitoring, air sampling, if that person that's going to go into that space, he or she certainly has the right to look at that permit where the results from the air sampling are being recorded so that they can determine, yes, you know, I, I understand. Here's what, we're, uh, here's what we're doing. Here's what I'm up against. Uh, and, you know, here's the site. Uh, you know, the site of, there could be some hazards I need to be able to recognize. Um, if something goes wrong, here's the potential for that. So they need to have all that information readily available to them. Uh, they need to know how to, know how to isolate any uh, physical hazards. The entry employer must also provide and test ventilation systems. And again, we're making sure that we're eliminating or controlling atmospheric hazards. We need to be able to provide protection from hazards outside the space, and then provide early warning systems for non-isolated engulfment hazards. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute because that's a that's a big one that's is new in the standard that could affect uh, several of you listening. Right, so the entry employers, a few more things continue, and they need to designate and train employees who have active roles in the entry process. So each role has specific duties that they have to do, and they need to be trained on how to do those specific duties. And then we also have to make sure the entry employer has developed a procedure for summoning rescue service. So dialing 911 and saying, no, that's my rescue, that doesn't cut it. Um, so we need to make sure that before any work is being done in that confined space, again, this is permit required, uh, we need to make sure that we know, in fact, how we're going to get someone out of that space if there happens to be you know, something goes wrong. And then we also need to make sure we train the employees on the hazards of attempting entry rescue. So unfortunately, you know, a little less than half of all confined space fatalities are due to those employees who are going in and attempting rescue in a confined space, and then they, in turn, end up being victims. So one instance that comes to mind is uh, at a, a hog operation in southern, you know, mid southern Illinois where a gentleman was working in a pit, and he went down, fell down. His son thought that uh, his dad had a heart attack, so he went down to see if he could help dad. He goes down. The second son comes along. He sees dad and his, his brother laying in the pit. He goes down in there. He goes down, and finally the hired man says, you know, oh, there must be a problem here. Doesn't go down, calls the fire department. They come out, and only to find out later, you know, that each of these three individuals um, had died for, from exposure to uh, methane, um, had killed all three of those guys. So again, one initial person and then two victims attempting rescue. So it's very important that we train employees on how hazardous it is to try to go down into a confined space to perform rescue. And then the other thing the entry employer needs to do is annually they need to review all of the permits that they've filled out and canceled. In other words, that they're you know, completed permits. Annually, they have to review those and make sure that their program is working as required. All right, so let's get into the classification of a confined space. So to classify, number one, employers are required to classify each space. So they have to be able to determine what kind of confined space it is that they're working with. And again, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. There's three different classifications. There's the permit required alternate procedure, and non-permit required. So those are our three classifications. And to classify any space, the first thing you really need to do is air monitoring. So what are we looking for when we're testing the air? Well, we're looking for oxygen levels. Is it a deficiency? Or it can also be too much oxygen can be a problem. Um, combustible gases, so are there explosive gases? And then there are there toxic gases. Things like carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, those types of things, um, which would be a toxic poisonous gas. So we need to be monitoring the space for that initially. Before anybody goes into any type of confined space, they need to look and make sure that uh, that air monitoring has been conducted. And they know, in fact, that 
it's good. Air quality is good. If it's not, we need to make sure we figure out a way to uh, to control that. And then we need to monitor periodically and as necessary. So we have to make sure that we're documenting our results throughout the space uh, entry and make sure that those levels remain as they need to to be safe for the employees doing the entry. So one thing that's going to be required um, that uh, you know, is going to be, I'm not going to say a source of uh, controversy, but it's something we need to be thinking about immediately, is if I have a permit required confined space, I have to have an attendant outside that space at all, all times. And then the attendant's role basically is to, he's, he's making sure that everything's going okay within that space. And that can be his or her only job. So if someone's assigned to be the attendant in a permit required confined space, they can't do anything else. They can't be, you know, cutting material and, and you know, doing some house cleaning and that type of thing. They, are just, they have to be there to monitor at all times the people doing the work inside. Um, and then monitor continuously for non-isolated engulfment hazards using an early warning system. Now this is one of the ones that uh, there's still some talk out there about how exactly this is going to be done. So really what this comes down to is if you've got, you know, we see this picture here where this guy's inside of a, uh, a tunnel and the water is creeping up on him, whether it's slowly or very quickly, uh, we certainly don't want this to happen to anyone. So what this portion of the new standard is telling us is that we have to provide some way of determining if water levels are rising upstream from where the work is being provided. Uh, and there's way, two different ways that uh, there, the standard is saying you can do that, is you can post observers upstream. So now you've got another employee that that's what their job is, is that they're monitoring the flow of water. Or you can use a detection or monitoring device upstream. Now I've yet to find any of these devices that are commercially available. Uh, perhaps there are, and I just have not been able to locate them. But it's something that, uh, you know, one of these two things you have to do if you're working in a confined space that has an engulfment hazard, like in a sewer where the water can rise, right? Is, you, is it rains in the city of Chicago especially? Um, you know, they've got tunnel systems where they can open gates and close gates depending on the water flow, and that water can come in there very quickly. So we need to make sure that we're, we're monitoring that and getting people out in the event that the water levels start to rise. And so again, for permit required confined spaces, some things that we need to have in place. So we have to authorize our entry. As again, we, we talked about earlier, only authorized employees can enter a confined space. And we want to limit entry. Well, how are we going to do that? We need to make sure we're installing warning lines and danger signs telling people this is a confined space, it's permit required, stay out. Inform employees and controlling contractors on the measures that you're using to limit entry. What are you going to have in place? Again, pre-job planning just for anything else is critical that it's all in place, everybody understands the plan before the job actually starts. And we need to make sure we've completed arrangement for rescue of employees. And there's a whole little section we're going to do on rescue here. I'm going to explain a little bit more about what's required with that, so hang, hang with me for that for a few minutes. Uh, training on required specific duties. So if we look at the next you know, part here is, well, what kind of training are we talking about? We well, have to be trained to be an entry supervisor. You have to be trained if you're an attendant on what you need to be looking for. If you're an entrance specific training, a rescue service employees have to have specific confined space rescue training. Uh, so again, just because maybe you're thinking, well, there's a fire department here, they can provide that uh, rescue for us. So not even all fire departments are uh, available and, and ready to do rescue. So we want to make sure that we know that ahead of time. We want to know how to respond to uh, fall protection. Issues. Again, training on the dangers of performing rescue. So that needs to go out to everybody who works on a space or on a site where there is uh, confined space out there. It's got to be completed again prior to entry and uh, must receive training if a new hazard is introduced. All right, so if we're looking at the permit, the permit's got to be completed and it has to include those conditions that would enable safe entry. How are we isolating things? Are we doing lockout tagout? How are we doing lockout tagout? Do we have a lockout tagout program? So we need to make sure that that's taken care of. Um, air monitoring. We're looking at we're doing that correctly. We want to make sure that we've got the right kind of monitor. 
uh, a monitor that's set up properly. People know how to set it. Has the calibration been done? Do entrants have sufficient time to, to get out of the space if ventilation fails? I'm sure we, we know how to do these things. And other initial tasks include, you know, again, we have to identify all permanent required confined spaces and post signs. Um, if no employees are you know, going to be required to enter that space, we need to put up barriers that prevent anyone from entering that space, again, with danger signs and just informing employees of that location. Once again, we're back to communication. It's key if there's a uh, confined space on your job site. So if we're looking at our, our permit, so there's just a picture one there, um, written permits need to include you know, some specific key elements, including things like the hazard within the space, what methods are we going to use to protect employees from those hazards, and then it's going to specify you know, who is authorized to perform work within the space. Also, it specifies who the attendants are and who the entry supervisor is as well. So there's a lot of information that goes on to a, a permit that we need to be very aware of how to fill those out and how to fill them out correctly. We talked a little bit about alternate procedures earlier, um, again, that being another one of the classifications. And again, I just want to make sure that we're very clear that it's controlled atmosphere. So again, the only hazard that's present is atmospheric or there's a potential for atmospheric hazard. There can't be any other physical hazards. So if we had a possibility of an engulfment hazard, storm sewer, cannot be considered an alternate procedure because that hazard is still present or potentially present as well. And ventilation is going to maintain the operation at uh, safe levels, but just remember, it doesn't eliminate it. So again, we want to make sure that if that ventilation system shuts down, we can get people out of that site. Uh, you know, we know how we're going to get them out of there, and it's not going to be something that's going to be a, a danger because we, it takes too long for them to get out. Couldn't do an alternate procedure if we didn't have that plan in place. And all this has to be documented so we can prove this is why we know this is an alternate procedure. Employees must not enter the space until the forced air ventilation has begun. Okay, so we gotta, if we're going to deem that this is an alternate procedure, we have to make sure that we test the air prior to ventilating, and then we have to test the air again once ventilation is established to make sure that those levels are, in fact, safe. Um, that ventilation has to continue at all times while employees are in the space. And really being careful with, with ventilation that the air supply is from a clean source. So we don't want to be setting up our fans next to somebody's generator, and now we're shoving you know, uh, carbon monoxide down into a confined space. We just created another hazard. So you got to be really careful about your air sources. Let's provide continuous monitoring. So we've got that space. We're ventilating. We need to be looking at that monitor and making sure that those air levels are maintained at a safe level. And then, to, again, determine if ventilation stops, we can get guys out of there. And then the last one is of our classification is non-permit. Um, to make something a non-permit space, you have to determine um, that all physical hazards have been isolated. Um, atmospheric hazards are non-existent. We've got to be able to isolate from the outside the space. So again, there's no problems with anything that's going to come at us from the outside. Um, if a space must be entered to isolate, so we've got to get in there to do our lockout tagout, we're going to have to open that space as a permit required space. And then once you've got all the hazards uh, removed or isolated, then you might be able to reclassify it. But if you've got to go in there to, to take care of the hazards in the first place, you're going to have to open that as a permit required space first. All right, again, documentation is key. It is required. And you've got to show why this is, in fact, a non-permit space. And then employees entering the space must be trained to recognize hazards and isolation methods. So if something isn't right, hey, this is no longer a, a non-permit space. You know, something's gone wrong here. We need to know that they need to get out of there and they can make sure that they're safe. All right? Maybe we can reassess the space. Say we started it out. Again, we're looking at this as a, uh, a permit required space. We know we're going to be able to lock everything out. We're going to be able to reassess it. Um, if that's one form of reassessment, we can you know, take it to another level. We also may need to reassess if something happens inside the space that wasn't there when we initially started. So some things that can cause a reassessment, hey, i got to get everybody out of here because something's not like we thought it was. Conditions have changed. Maybe there's a new material that was introduced that we didn't think about. It's producing some kind of a fume that we have to be you know, very cautious of. Um, 
the employer authorized representative believes that the assessment was inadequate. So they get in there and they're thinking, hey, wait, wait a minute, there's water that's running in here. That wasn't on the permit. So something's not right with our permit. Got to get out and reassess. Um, unauthorized entry. If somebody comes down to that's not supposed to be, everybody out, reassess the space, find out why that person even came in there. There's the detection of a hazard uh, near the space. So we've got work going on outside that now it could be causing gases to, to drip into our space. We've got to reassess and figure out what we're going to do with that thing. Um, detection of a hazard that exceeds the plan condition or any occurrence during entry that resulted in injury, death, or a near miss. Obviously, we're going to want to shut down work, get everybody out, and do a reassessment on that to make sure that, again, we're controlling all of those hazards and we're not going to get anybody else hurt. So let's look at training. So a lot of information so far, we're going to train people on how to be very aware of the information that we've already covered. So when we're looking at training, um, training requirements, well, number one, they've got to be documented. So there's a, there's a saying out there that I like to go with is that if it's not documented, it never happened. So it may sound a little callous, but you got to be able to prove that you've done some, some kind of training. So we got to document, and then they have to be maintained. So retraining employees, um, you know, we've done the initial training. We may need to do some retraining if the employees are deviating from the entry procedure. You know, they're just not getting it, uh, is another case. They don't have the knowledge or the skills that are needed. We're going to do some retraining because, again, as dangerous as confined spaces can be, we want to make sure that everybody has the training and that they understand it. So just providing training doesn't always work. We have to make sure that they understand the training that they're getting. Which leads us to this next slide, which talks about training requirements. So the training has got to be done in a language the employee can understand. I think we've all probably been to a training where there's a couple of guys sitting in the back of the room, and we know that they don't understand the training, but they sign the sign-in sheet, and therefore we're saying, oh, OK, we've got all our employees trained. Have to make sure that the employees understand the training that they're being uh, presented. Before the employee starts duty, so we can't say, go ahead and start working in this confined space, and at noon, uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll do the training. The training has to be done before the work even begins. If there's a change in someone's assigned duties, they were only supposed to be an entrant, and now we're going to make them an attendant. Well, did they have attendant training? Do they know what they need to do with that? Now they're going to be running the air monitor. They've never even looked at an air monitor. You know, we need to make sure they know how to run that air monitor. If there's a change within the space, you know, maybe we have to have some new training on that. There's, again, evidence of deviation from the permit space procedures. They're not following the rules that are set in place. Um, and the employer must maintain training records to show, hey, these are the people I've trained, and this is the training that I did. And just make sure that when you are documenting your training, that the training attendance sheet has what training was performed. It has the employees who were there. I always recommend that they print and sign and then make sure that whoever did the training, that uh, that name is on the space, or excuse me, on the document as well. Other things employees need to be trained on include atmospheric and monitoring equipment. So if we're going to monitor the air, obviously we need to have to know how to use that monitor. If we're using ventilation, make sure the ventilation systems, when they're up and running, the guys know what to look for if there's a problem with that. Talk about PPE. What PPE are the guys going to be wearing when they're in there? Big one that comes to play here is uh, respirators. So if you have a guy who's wearing a respirator, and this just doesn't include it in a confined space, but anytime you have an employee who's wearing a respirator, he or she has to be, number one, medically cleared. They have to be fit tested. They have to have um, a, the, a doctor's OK with that. Everybody says, all right, we're good. We're fit tested. And then we're making sure that we've got a program in place. So there's a lot goes into uh, respirator training you need to be very aware of. And then any other equipment that's needed for confined space operations. So we're looking up here on the top, there's a picture there, all kinds of different things for confined spaces, one of them being a tripod. We want to make sure that employees know how to operate a tripod for non-entry rescue if that's something that they're going to be doing. Well, that takes us right to rescue. So what do we need for that? Well, there's two different types of rescue. So one is non-entry and the other being actual entry into the space to perform rescue. So when we look at non-entry rescue, obviously this is the preferred method because we want to be able to get a guy out of the space without having to send anybody else in to, to you know, be, again, subjected to those same hazards. So non-entry rescue is the best thing that we can do. 
uh, retrieval systems. It can be used by the attendant, how we want to make sure that we're doing non-entry rescue. You know, different parts of a non-entry rescue system include you know, body harnesses, retrieval lines, mechanical devices. Um, if you're using, you know, if you're in a confined space that's over five feet in depth, you have to have a means of a mechanical device to get that person out. And they have to be powered by humans. Right? You can't hook it up to a backhoe and say, okay, you know, let's go, and then you, know, you end up you, you know, tearing your entrance in half because he was hung up on some pipe or something. So it has to be something where you can feel that something's not moving right, I need to stop. Uh, and if your attendant's using this you know, system, they need to practice on that and understand exactly how that works. There's other equipment out there like wristlets or ankle straps that can be used in the event that maybe a guy's working at a pipe. I certainly don't want to have something hooked onto a D-ring on their back and then you begin pulling on that and you fold them in half while you're trying to get them out of a pipe. So maybe wristlets or ankle straps. So again, we're back to our pre-planning. Know ahead of time what's going to work for any confined space. All right? Looking at, you know, again, when we're talking about um, systems that you can use to get a guy out of a, uh, a confined space, and we're not always over top of a, a manhole where we can simply set up a tripod with a, a wind system on it. You've got a trench box or you've got something like this, you know, a, an excavation. How do, you, uh, how do you get a guy out? Well, here is a perfect picture of uh, this davit arm that uh, is commercially available where you can, it's got a clamp on it, and you can put this on the side of a trench box. You can put it on the side of a jersey barrier. And you can use that to get a, a person out of a space where you, you don't have the, the way to set up a tripod. It just isn't going to work. So there are systems and means out there for doing that. And again, we need to be aware ahead of time that these systems are available. Um, so we can't use the infeasible defense where there's no such thing. There is. So we want to make sure that with that, we're using them and we're getting them as we need them. All right, entry rescue is, uh, again, our, our second option. Non-entry is always first. If we do have to have somebody actually go down into a confined space to get someone, we can either use a professional service or an on-site safety team to perform that task. The rescue service must, there's a couple things we need to be very aware of. They need to be advised of the work uh, to be performed prior to entry. So this is going to be a big one. So before people start working on construction sites where they're going to need rescue, they need to make sure that they're talking to the fire department, if that's who they deem they're going to use, they got to talk to those people ahead of time and make sure that, number one, they have people who are trained to do it, and number two, that they're available to do it, um, and they have to agree to do it. So we, again, we can't just say, we're going to call 911 and that's going to be it. You have to have serious communication with whoever it is that you're going to uh, have provide your rescue for your site. You can train your own team. That's fine. Um, we have been involved in that, as a matter of fact, in, in training uh, team on how to do their own confined space rescue, and there are certain specifics that you need to be very aware of with that. Number one, they have to be trained, obviously, to uh, to be a confined space rescue team. They have to be trained on the equipment that they're going to be using. Training in first aid CPR is also required, and then a big one is that they have to perform a basically it's a mock rescue at least annually. So once a year, they have to practice on rescuing because we all know if you, you know, stop doing things, you, you forget how to do it. So we got to keep our skills honed on how to do these uh, entry rescues if we're training our own teams. So finally, the implementation timeline. So a lot of information. So where are we at in this? What, what's, uh, what's the current status? Well, the new standard was supposed to be completely implemented by August 3rd. That has been pushed back um, for full enforcement until August, excuse me, October the 2nd of this year. So there's been some additional time given, so there's extra uh, time, actually extra, you know, two extra months, really, that we can get uh, fully implemented with this program. However, in the meantime, you know, we don't want everybody waiting until uh, August, uh, or excuse me, October 1st and say, we better get moving on this. Um, we have to be showing now, as of August 3rd, that we are in good faith putting effort into getting our people uh, ready for this new statute standard. Uh, so good faith efforts include things like training. So we've got a training that we have scheduled that's on the books. 
Um, it's not something we're thinking about. We've got it. We know when we're doing it. We've got a person lined up to do it. Uh, program development. So in our safety manuals, we now have something in confined spaces. And then also, even the purchase of new equipment. So we're out, we're buying these David arms, we're getting more air monitors, we're buying harnesses. So all these types of things could be ways of showing, you know what, we are, in fact, working towards implementing this standard. Excellent. Jerry, that's our uh, last slide on our presentation today. So uh, as we're uh, complete with the content portion of the presentation, we're going to move into a time of Q&A. So we'll uh, give Jerry a second to gather his thoughts here. That's a lot of information. I really appreciate him uh, bringing a lot of great info to us. We've seen a, a number of questions come up, Jerry, through the uh, question portion of the uh, webinar as you've been presenting. And uh, what I've done is I've attempted to group these together so we can uh, hit these in kind of sections. And uh, the first thing we want to talk about is roles. Um, so there's been several questions uh, related to roles that were presented. And uh, the first question is, do I need an attendant for all confined spaces? No. The only time that you would need an attendant is if it's a, is a permit required confined space. So if it, you've deemed it permit required, you must have an attendant at all times. OK, great. So the, def the difference or the dividing line is that, or the defining line is that permit required check. Correct. OK. All right, excellent. The uh, next question on roles is, uh, can one attendant monitor more than one space? Yes, you can use the same attendant to monitor more than one space as long as, again, you've got the documentation. You can show how are you doing that. So if you've got radio contact uh, with more than one employee who's in a space, that's fine. But you just need to be able to make sure that you can effectively monitor more than one. OK, and it's not more than one entrance but even more than one more space. Than one space. So as as they're in close proximity, and they can correct. watch over that. OK, excellent. Obviously, that'd be something they'd have to be very careful in how they're doing, that we don't use that rule just to say we're complying, but that it's right. totally ineffective. Right. And just like anything else, again, when we talk about planning, well, we certainly need to be testing that that is, in fact, effective, that that person can, can maintain contact with any confined space that he's monitoring. Excellent. OK. And then you, you defined several roles through the training today. And they were uh, entrants or supervisors or attendants. And one of the questions that got posed is, can one person assume more than one duty, such as the supervisor and the attendant? Yes. The, uh, the supervisor could, in fact, be, um, he could be the supervisor and the attendant. He could even be the supervisor and the uh, and entry employee. But obviously, you cannot be the entrance and the attendant at the same time. And one thing that really needs to be clarified with that is, as soon as any portion of the attendant's body breaks the plane of that confined space, he has now just become an entrance. And we'd have to have another attendant on duty. Excellent. Thanks for clarifying that. OK, great. So another section that uh, we have several uh, questions in relates to addicts. OK. OK. So, um, one of the questions was, would an attic, and then this is a little bit different space, or a mechanical rooftop unit be considered a confined space? If it meets the criteria, um, yes, it would be. So if it meets those three criteria, it would be considered a confined space. So walk us back through that in the case of an attic. So an attic would be, so you could get into an attic to, uh, to perform work, so you can get your entire body into that attic to do some work. Um, limited means of entry, so I'm guessing there's going to be a ladder that, uh, that's required for you to get in there. And then also it would be, um, it's not designed for continuous occupancy. So, you know, attics are generally someplace maybe you're doing some storage or that's where electrical might run through. But it's not someplace that it's set up uh, for someone to be there, you know, constantly, consistently. So it would meet the, the criteria for being a confined space. Excellent. Okay, good. So. Uh, another one of the questions that came up on addicts, and this is a little bit more of an application, or you know, we run into this with other standards where people have to enter areas of a construction site to do inspections and so on. And the question was, what requirements are there for salespeople entering addicts on occasion for inspection, or if they have to go into the space to review a piece of equipment that's in there inside of an attic? Now, that would be one of those questions where uh, I have not gotten complete clarification on how that uh, is set up as of yet. So 
Unfortunately, I can't give you an answer at this time. And that's okay. Like I said at the beginning of the, the webinar, there are a number of questions. I would say for uh, the person who fielded that question that there are, uh, we will at the end of our webinar be sending out an email with a link to the uh, OSHAsafetyManagement.com Optimum's webpage, uh, website. Um, we'll be sending a link to our website page on the confined space standard for construction, which is brand new. We're rolling that out today as a result of this webinar. You'll be able to find there a uh, link to a um, uh, checklist document that we've talked about. There will also be several blog articles and resource links there. One of the resource links that I know is on that website is a frequently asked question document from the OSHA website about attic spaces. So that would be a great resource to help answer some of those questions and begin to get uh, uh, kind of an understanding of how that's going to apply to your specific situation. Um, air monitoring is another hot spot for us as far as questions go, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the questions is, is it the responsibility of the controlling host or entry contractor to provide air monitoring for the spaces that will be entered? It would be the entry uh, employer. They're the ones whose employers are going into that space, so they would need to be providing that. They need to make sure that they may not be doing the monitoring, but they have to ensure that the monitoring is being done, that, the, that their employees are being monitored while they're in there. Very good. So a lot of this sounds like it goes back to the multi-employer worksite policy where the exposing contractor in that policy is the one that's responsible Correct. for protecting their employees. Um, just what I've seen OSHA has done here is they're requiring the host employer and the controlling employer to provide information to that exposing contractor. Correct. Again, communication is key. They just want everybody involved to know what everybody else is doing. Very good. Okay, excellent. Another question on uh, air monitoring. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions here. So one on air monitoring again is, do you need full-time monitoring if it's a non-permit space just to prove that there was never an error issue, or can I measure it once and then just go to town with my work? If it's going to be a non-permit space and you deem that there are no air quality issues, then uh, no, you can perform that initial monitoring and then it would would simply be a, a confined space. Excellent. Okay, and I would imagine that would relate to what type of space it is as well. If, if this is a space that has an inbound pipe that's connected to a live sewer and you measure initially and you find out that there's no bad air in that space, you can't just no, assume so it'll stay that way. <laughs> because again, at that point, that would be a permit required confined space and then it needs to be monitored constantly. Right, because you have the potential. Correct. But with a uh, static closed structure uh, like a, a valve vault or something that is isolated and there's nothing coming into it, right? you're checking initially to make sure there's no hydrogen sulfide or something like that in there. Correct. And through your evaluation, you, you've determined, and again, we need to make sure when we're doing our evaluations that it's not only not an atmospheric hazard at the time, but there's no potential for atmospheric hazard. So okay. even if the potential is there, it still cannot be a, a, a non permit space. Okay, very good. And um, the, another question that has come up, it's kind of funny the way this was stated, is uh, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's going to be a good one when it yeah. starts that way. Are you serious that this standard requires me to call the fire department before doing entry rescue, like in a PRCS mm -hmm. space, that I need rescue? If I'm going to use the fire department, I have to call the fire department before I ever enter in the space to make sure that they'll they are available to do it, and they will do it. Yes, they have to be. They, again, it's an, again, we're back to communication. And my concern is that as the fire departments possibly get overwhelmed with so many people saying, "Hey, we need you to be able to uh, to perform rescue for us today because we're doing a space," uh, that the fire departments may at some point in time say, "You know what? No, we're not doing it anymore. Um, we're done." So at that point in time, you know, we're going to be able to look at. How are we going to do rescue? We may have to start a, a lot of, you know, conducting training with our own people to do confined space rescue. So we, so we just, I, I'm not sure if you just answered this question because I was reading two other questions that just came in, but somebody said, what if the fire department says no? Yeah. Then you got to find another rescue service or you got to train your own people. Okay. 
So we need to be self-sufficient on this if the fire department won't do it for us. And like I said before, some fire departments, and we have run into this ourselves, where we went to the fire department uh, for a client and said, hey, we need you to be able to perform rescue for us. And they said, we don't have anybody here who's a confined space rescue trained. So then the client had to train their own people. Okay, great. Jerry, I think we've got time for one more question, and one just came in. So we'll do the best we can to answer this one. It's uh, The question says, who issues the permit for a permit required confined space, and how do I get a permit? Who issues the permit would be the entry employer. So that employer who's, uh, you know, they're the ones who have people actually going into that space. So they would have to have the permit. Um, their supervisor, their entry supervisor, would be the individual who fills that permit out. And then as far as where you can get a permit, um, you know, there are numerous programs out there where you can get them. Um, I know uh, just a, a plug, Optimum Safety Management certainly uh, provides uh, that type of thing, and we have that kind of documentation. So it is available. Um, you just have to do some, a little bit of research for it. Absolutely. So at that point, we're going to close the question and answer portion and just wrap the webinar up here today. But I uh, want to make sure everybody's been seeing on the slide that's open that there are some free resources available. Uh, we will be sending an email out to all participants as soon as the recording is posted of the webinar. It will take uh, possibly the afternoon. So you'll see that either late today or first thing Monday morning. But there will be a copy of the webinar slide handouts, the confined space entry implementation checklist for construction. We will have the webinar recording in its entirety. There are several blog articles and resource links there as well as other checklists and quick reference guides. So I would encourage you to visit our website, take a look at that information. Check back often. You can subscribe to our eSafety newsletter there, which uh, comes out uh, monthly, and that has great articles on upcoming uh, compliance and safety topics. Still have questions? Uh, give us a call. We have a safety helpline. Uh, you can submit questions to safety helpline at optimum-usa.com, or you can call our office at 888-707-2338. Jerry and I are the uh, safety professionals here to field those questions. It's our vision here at Optimum that workers everywhere would be valued and safe, and this is our commitment to that vision. We really desire to try and help and be a resource for those that are out actually doing the work in the workplace and helping the supervisors manage safety effectively. So at this point, I want to just say thank you, and we're going to conclude our webinar right on time here at 2 p.m. Have a safe day, and uh, we will be looking forward to seeing you again at another webinar in the future. Again, have a great day.